Chapter Eleven of the Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers, by Catherine Crow. Chapter Eleven: The Power of Will. The power be it what it may, whether of dressing up an ethereal visible form, or of acting on the constructive imagination of the seer, which would enable a spirit to appear in his habit as he lived, would also enable him to present any other object to the eye of the seer, or himself, in any shape or fulfilling any function he willed. And we thus find in various instances, especially those recorded in the seerist of Preborst, that this is the case. We not only see changes of dress, but we see books, pens, writing materials, etc., in their hands, and we find a great variety of sounds imitated, which sounds are frequently heard not only by those who have the faculty of discerning of spirits, as St. Paul says, but also by every other person on the spot, for the hearing these sounds does not seem to depend on any particular faculty on the part of the auditor, except it be in the case of speech. The hearing the speech of a spirit, on the contrary, appears in most instances to be dependent on the same conditions as the seeing it, which may possibly arise from there being, in fact, no audible voice at all. But the same sort of spiritual communication which exists between a magnetizer and his patient, wherein the sense is conveyed without words. This imitating of sounds I shall give several instances of in a future chapter. It is one way in which a death is frequently indicated. I could quote a number of examples of this description, but shall confine myself to two or three. Mrs. D., being one night in her kitchen preparing to go to bed after the house was shut up and the rest of the family retired, was startled by hearing a foot coming along the passage, which she recognized distinctly to be that of her father, who she was quite certain was not in the house. It advanced to the kitchen door and she waited with alarm to see if the door was to open, but it did not, and she heard nothing more. On the following day she found that her father had died at that time, and it was from her niece I heard the circumstance. A Mr. J. S., belonging to a highly respectable family with whom I am acquainted, having been for some time in declining health, was sent abroad for change of air. During his absence one of his sisters, having been lately confined, an old servant of the family was sitting half asleep in an armchair in a room adjoining that in which the lady slept, when she was startled by hearing the foot of Mr. J. S. ascending the stairs. It was easily recognizable, for owing to his constant confinement to the house, in consequence of his infirm health, his shoes were always so dry that their creaking was heard from one end of the house to the other. So far surprised out of her recollection as to forget he was not in the country, the good woman started up and rushing out with her candle in her hand to light him, she followed the steps up to Mr. J. S.'s own bedchamber, never discovering that he was not preceding her till she reached the door. She then returned quite amazed, and having mentioned the occurrence to her mistress, they noted the date, and it was afterward ascertained that the young man had died at Lisbon on that night. Mrs. F. tells me that being one morning at eleven o'clock engaged in her bedroom, she suddenly heard a strange, indescribable, sweet but unearthly sound, which apparently proceeded from a large open box which stood near her. She was seized with an awe and a horror which there seemed nothing to justify, and fled upstairs to mention the circumstance which she could not banish from her mind. At that precise day and hour, eleven o'clock, her brother was drowned. The news reached her two days after. Instances of this kind are so well known that it is unnecessary to multiply them further. With respect to the mode of producing these sounds, however, I should be glad to say something more definite if I could. But from the circumstance of their being heard not only by one person, who might be supposed to be en rapport, or whose constructive imagination might be acted upon, but by any one who happens to be within hearing, we are led to conclude that the sounds are really reverberating through the atmosphere. In the strange cases recorded in the Seeress of Prevorst, although the apparitions were visible only to certain persons, the sounds they made were audible to all, and the Seeress says they are produced by means of the nerve spirit, 
which I conclude is the spiritual body of St. Paul in the atmosphere, as we produce sound by means of our material body in the atmosphere. In this plastic power of the spirit to present to the eye of the seer whatever object it wills, we find the explanation of such stories as the famous one of Fincius and Mercatus, related by Baronius in his Annals. These two illustrious friends, Michael Mercatus and Marcolinius Fincus, after a long discourse on the nature of the soul, had agreed that if possible whichever died first should return to visit the other. Some time afterward, while Mercatus was engaged in study at an early hour in the morning, he suddenly heard the noise of a horse galloping in the street, which presently stopped at his door, and the voice of his friend Fincius exclaimed, O oh Michael! O oh Michael! Viva sunt illa! Those things are true! Whereupon Mercatus hastily opened his window, and espied his friend Fincius on a white steed. He called after him, but he galloped away out of his sight. On sending to Florence to inquire for Fincius, he learned that he had died about that hour he called to him. From this period to that of his death, Mercatus abandoned all profane studies, and addicted himself wholly to divinity. Baronius lived in the sixteenth century, and even Dr. Ferrier and the spectral illusionists admit that the authenticity of this story cannot be disputed, although they still claim it for their own. Not very many years ago, Mr. C., a staid citizen of Edinburgh, whose son told me the story, was one day riding gently up Corstephine Hill, in the neighborhood of the city, when he observed an intimate friend of his own on horseback also immediately behind him. So he slackened his pace to give him an opportunity of joining company. Finding he did not come up so quickly as he should, he looked round again, and was astonished at no longer seeing him, since there was no side road into which he could have disappeared. He returned home, perplexed at the oddness of the circumstance, when the first thing he learned was that during his absence this friend had been killed by his horse falling in Candlemaker's Row. I have heard of another circumstance which occurred some years ago in Yorkshire, where, I think, a farmer's wife was seen to ride into a farmyard on horseback, but could not afterward be found, or the thing accounted for, till it was ascertained that she had died at that period. There are very extraordinary stories extant in all countries of persons being annoyed by appearances in the shape of different animals, which one would certainly be much disposed to give over altogether to the illusionists though at the same time it is very difficult to reduce some of the circumstances under that theory, especially one mentioned, page 307, of my translation of the seerist of Prevorst. If they are not illusions, they are phenomena to be attributed either to this plastic power, or to that magico-magnetic influence in which the belief in lycanthropy and other strange transformations have originated. The multitudes of unaccountable stories of this description, recorded in the witch trials, have long furnished a subject of perplexity to everybody who was sufficiently just to human nature to conclude that there must have been some strange mystery at the bottom of an infatuation that prevailed so universally, and in which so many sensible, honest, and well-meaning persons were involved. Till of late years, when some of the arcana of animal or vital magnetism have been disclosed to us, it was impossible for us to conceive by what means such strange conceptions could prevail. But since we now know, and many of us have witnessed, that all the senses of a patient are frequently in such subjection to his magnetizer, that they may be made to convey any impressions to the brain that magnetizer wills, we can without much difficulty conceive how this belief in the power of transformation took its rise and we also know how a magician could render himself visible or invisible at pleasure. I have seen the sight or hearing of a patient taken away, and restored by Mr. Spencer Hall in a manner that could leave no doubt on the mind of the beholder, the evident paralysis of the eye of the patient testifying to the fact. M. Eusebi Salverte, the most determined of rationalistic skeptics, admits that we have numerous testimonies to the existence of an art, which he confesses himself at some loss to explain, although the opposite quarters from which the accounts of it reach us render it difficult to imagine that the historians have copied each other. The various transformations of the gods into eagles, bulls, etc. have been set down as mere mythological fables, but they appear to have been founded on an art, known in all quarters of the world, which enabled the magician to take on a form that was not his own so as to deceive his nearest and dearest friends. 
in the history of genghis khan there is mention of a city which he conquered in which dwelt says Sudas, certain men who possessed the secret of surrounding themselves with deceptive appearances insomuch that they were able to represent themselves to the eyes of people quite different to what they really were saxo grammaticus in speaking of the traditions connected with the religion of odin says that the magi were very expert in the art of deceiving the eyes being able to assume and even to enable others to assume the forms of various objects and to conceal their real aspects under the most attractive appearances john of salisbury who seems to have drawn his information from sources now lost says that mercury the most expert of magicians had the art of fascinating the eyes of men to such a degree as to render people invisible or make them appear in forms quite different to what they really bore we also learn from an eyewitness that simon the magician possessed the secret of making another person resemble him so perfectly that every eye was deceived pomponius mela affirms that the druidesses of the island of Sina could transform themselves into any animal they chose and proteus has become a proverb by his numerous metamorphoses then to turn to another age and another hemisphere we find joseph acosta who resided a long time in peru assuring us that there existed at that period magicians who had the power of assuming any form they chose he relates that the predecessor of montezuma having sent to arrest a certain chief the latter successively transformed himself into an eagle a tiger and an immense serpent and so eluded the envoys till having consented to obey the king's mandate he was carried to court and instantly executed the same perplexing exploits are confidently attributed to the magicians of the west indies and there were two men eminent among the natives the one called gomez and the other gonzales who possessed this art in an eminent degree but both fell victims to the practice of it being shot during the period of their apparent transformations it is also recorded that nanook the founder of the sikhs who were not properly a nation but a religious sect was violently opposed by the hindu zealots and at one period of his career when he visited vatala the yogaswaras who were recluses that by means of corporeal mortifications were supposed to have acquired command over the powers of nature were so enraged against him that they strove to terrify him by their enchantments assuming the shapes of tigers and serpents but they could not succeed for nanook appears to have been a real philosopher who taught a pure theism and inculcated universal peace and toleration his tenets like the tenets of the founders of all religions have been since corrupted by his followers we can scarcely avoid concluding that the power by which these feats were performed is of the same nature as that by which a magnetizer persuades his patients that the water he drinks is beer or the beer wine and the analogy between it and that by which i have supposed a spirit to present himself with such accompaniments as he desires to the eye of a spectator is evident in those instances where female figures are seen with children in their arm the appearance of the child we must suppose to be produced in this manner spirits of darkness however cannot as i have before observed appear as spirits of light the moral nature cannot be disguised on one occasion when frederica hoff asked a spirit if he could appear in what form he pleased he answered no that if he had lived as a brute he should appear as a brute as our dispositions are so we appear to you this plastic power is exhibited in those instances i have related where the figure appeared dripping with water indicating the kind of death that had been suffered and also in such cases as that of sir robert h e where the apparition showed a wound in his breast there are a vast number of similar ones on record in all countries but i will here mention one which i received from the lips of a member of the family concerned wherein one of the trivial actions of life was curiously represented miss l lived in the country with her three brothers to whom she was much attached as they were to her these young men who amused themselves all the morning with their outdoor pursuits were in the habit of coming to her apartment most days before dinner and conversing with her till they were summoned to the dining-room one day when two of them had joined her as usual and they were chatting cheerfully over the fire the door opened and the third came in crossed the room entered an adjoining one took off his boots and then instead of sitting down beside them as usual passed again through the room went out 
leaving the door open, and they saw him ascend the stairs toward his own chamber, whither they concluded he was gone to change his dress. These proceedings had been observed by the whole party. They saw him enter, saw him take off his boots, saw him ascend the stairs, continuing the conversation without the slightest suspicion of anything extraordinary. Presently, afterward, the dinner was announced, and as this young man did not make his appearance, the servant was desired to let him know they were waiting for him. The servant answered that he had not come in yet, but being told that he would find him in his bedroom, he went upstairs to call him. He was, however, not there, nor in the house, nor were his boots to be found where he had been seen to take them off. While they were yet wondering what could have become of him, a neighbor arrived to break the news to the family that their beloved brother had been killed while hunting, and that the only wish he expressed was that he could live to see his sister once more. I observed in a former chapter, while speaking of wraiths, how very desirable it would be to ascertain whether the phenomenon takes place before or after the dissolution of the bond between soul and body. I have since received the most entire satisfaction on that head, so far as the establishing the fact that it does sometimes occur after the dissolution. Three cases have been presented to me from the most undoubted authority in which the wraith was seen at intervals varying from one to three days after the decease of the person whose image it was, very much complicating the difficulty of that theory which considers these phenomena the result of an interaction wherein the vital principle of one person is able to influence another within its sphere, and thus make the organs of that other the subjects of its will, a magical power, by the way, which far exceeds that which we possess over our own organs. There is here, however, where death has taken place, no living organism to produce the effect, and the phenomenon becomes, therefore, purely subjective, a mere spectral illusion attended by a coincidence, or else the influence is that of the disembodied spirit. And those who will take the trouble of investigating this subject will find that the number of these coincidences would violate any theory of probabilities, to a degree that precludes the acceptance of that explanation. I do not see, therefore, on what we are to fall back, except it be the willing agency of the released spirit, unless we suppose that the operation of the will of the dying person travelled so slowly that it did not take effect till a day or two after it was exerted, an hypothesis too extravagant to be admitted. Dr. Passavent, whose very philosophical work on this occult department of nature is well worth attention, considers the fact of these appearances far too well established to be disputed, and he enters into some curious disquisitions with regard to what the Germans call far-working, or the power of acting on bodies at a distance without any sensible conductor, instancing the case of a gymnotus, which was kept alive for four months in Stockholm, and which, when urged by hunger, could kill fish at a distance without contact adding that it rarely miscalculated the amount of the shock necessary to its purpose. These, and all such effects, are attributed by this school of physiologists to the supposed imponderable, the nervous ether I have elsewhere mentioned, which Dr. Passavent conceives in cases of somnambulism, certain sicknesses, and the approach of death to be less closely united to its material conductors, the nerves, and therefore capable of being more or less detached and acting at a distance especially on those with whom relationship, friendship, or love establishes a rapport, or polarity. And he observes that intervening substances or distance can no more impede this agency than they do the agency of mineral magnetism. And he considers that we must here seek for the explanation of those curious so-called coincidences of pictures falling and clocks and watches stopping at the moment of a death, which we frequently find recorded. With respect to the wraiths, he observes that the more the ether is freed as by trance or the immediate approach of death, the more easily the soul sets itself in rapport with distant persons, and thus it either acts magically, so that the seer perceives the real actual body of the person that is acting upon him, or else that he sees the ethereal body, which presents the perfect form of the fleshly one, and which, while the organic life proceeds, can be momentarily detached and appear elsewhere and this ethereal body he holds to be the fundamental form of which the external body is only the copy, or husk. I confess I much prefer this theory of Dr. Passavent's, which seems to me to go very much to the root of the matter. We have here the spiritual body of St. Paul, 
and the nerve spirit of the somnambulists and their magical effects are scarcely more extraordinary if properly considered than their agency on our own material bodies it is this ethereal body which obeys the intelligent spirit within and which is the intermediate agent between the spirit and the fleshly body we here find the explanation of wraiths while persons are in trance or deep sleep or comatose this ethereal body can be detached and appear elsewhere and i think there can be no great difficulty for those who can follow us so far to go a little further and admit that this ethereal body must be indestructible and survive the death of the material one and that it may therefore not only become visible to us under given circumstances but that it may also produce effects bearing some similarity to those it was formerly capable of since in acting on our bodies during life it is already acting on a material substance in a matter so incomprehensible to us that we might well apply the word magical when speaking of it were it not that custom has familiarized us to the marvel it is to be observed that this idea of a spiritual body is one that pervaded all christendom in the earlier and purer ages of christianity before priestcraft and by priestcraft i mean the priestcraft of all denominations had overshadowed and obscured by its various sectarian heresies the pure teaching of jesus christ dr ennemoser mentions a curious instance of this actio in distans or far working it appears that van helmont having asserted that it was possible for a man to extinguish the life of an animal by the eye alone oculus intendus rousseau the naturalist repeated the experiment when in the east and in this manner killed several toads but on a subsequent occasion while trying the same experiment at Lyon, the animal on finding it could not escape fixed its eyes immovably on him so that he fell into a fainting fit and was thought to be dead he was restored by means of theriacum and viper powder a truly homeopathic remedy however we here probably see the origin of the universal popular persuasion that there is some mysterious property in the eye of a toad and also of the so-called superstition of the evil eye a very remarkable circumstance occurred some years ago at kirkaldy when a person for whose truth and respectability i can vouch was living in the family of a colonel m at that place the house they inhabited was at one extremity of the town and stood in a sort of paddock one evening when colonel m had dined out and there was nobody at home but mrs m her son a boy about twelve years old and anne the maid my informant mrs m called the latter and directed her attention to a soldier who was walking backward and forward in the drying ground behind the house where some linen was hanging on the lines she said she wondered what he could be doing there and bade anne fetch in the linen lest he should purloin any of it the girl fearing he might be some ill-disposed person felt afraid mrs m however promising to watch from the window that nothing happened to her she went but still apprehensive of the man's intentions she turned her back towards him and hastily pulled down the linen as she carried it into the house he continued his walk the while as before taking no notice of her whatsoever ere long the colonel returned and mrs m lost no time in taking him to the window to look at the man saying she could not conceive what he could mean by walking backward and forward there all that time whereupon anne added jestingly i think it's a ghost for my part colonel m said he would soon see that and calling a large dog that was lying in the room and accompanied by the little boy who begged to be permitted to go also he stepped out and approached the stranger when to his surprise the dog which was an animal of high courage instantly flew back and sprung through the glass door which the colonel had closed behind him shivering the panes all around the colonel meanwhile advanced and challenged the man repeatedly without obtaining any answer or notice whatever till at length getting irritated he raised a weapon with which he had armed himself telling him he must speak or take the consequences when just as he was preparing to strike lo there was nobody there the soldier had disappeared and the child sunk senseless to the ground colonel m lifted the boy in his arms and as he brought him into the house he said to the girl you are right anne it was a ghost he was exceedingly impressed with this circumstance and much regretted his own behaviour and also having taken the child with him which he thought had probably prevented some communication that was intended in order to repair if possible these errors he went out every night and walked on that spot for some time in hopes the apparition would return 
At length he said that he had seen and conversed with it, but the purport of the conversation he would never communicate to any human being, not even to his wife. The effect of this occurrence on his own character was perceptible to everybody that knew him. He became grave and thoughtful, and appeared like one who had passed through some strange experience. The above-named Anne H., from whom I have the account, is now a middle-aged woman. When the circumstance occurred she was about twenty years of age. She belongs to a highly respectable family, and is, and always has been, a person of unimpeachable character and veracity. In this instance, as in several others I meet with, the animal had a consciousness of the nature of the appearance, while the persons around him had no suspicion of anything unusual. In the following singular case we must conclude that attachment counteracted this instinctive apprehension. A farmer in Argyleshire lost his wife, and a few weeks after her decease, as he and his son were crossing a moor, they saw her sitting on a stone with their house-dog lying at her feet, exactly as he used to do when she was alive. As they approached the spot the woman vanished, and, supposing the dog must be equally visionary, they expected to see him vanish also, when, to their surprise, he rose and joined them, and they found it was actually the very animal of flesh and blood. As the place was at least three miles from any house they could not conceive what could have taken him there. It was probably the influence of her will. The power of will is a phenomenon that has been observed in all ages of the world, though of late years much less than at an earlier period, and, as it was then more frequently exerted for evil than good, it was looked upon as a branch of the art of black magic. While the philosophy of it being unknown, the devil was supposed to be the real agent, and the witch or wizard only his instrument. The profound belief in the existence of this art is testified by the twelve tables of Rome, as well as by the books of Moses and those of Plato, etc., it is extremely absurd to suppose that all these statutes were enacted to suppress a crime which never existed, and with regard to these witches and wizards we must remember, as Dr. Enemoser justly remarks, that the force of will has no relation to the strength or weakness of the body. Witness the extraordinary feats occasionally performed by feeble persons under excitement, etc., and although these witches and wizards were frequently weak, decrepit people, they either believed in their own arts, or else that they had a friend or coadjutor in the devil, who was able and willing to aid them. They therefore did not doubt their own power, and they had the one great requisite, faith, to will and to believe, by the Marquis de Pisiger of the Cures he performed, and this unconsciously becomes the recipe of all such men as Greatrix, the Shepherd of Dresden, and many other wonder-workers. And hence we see why it is usually the humble, the simple, and the childlike, the solitary, the recluse, nay, the ignorant, who exhibit traces of these occult faculties. For he who cannot believe cannot will, and the skepticism of the intellect disables the magician, and hence we say also wherefore in certain parts of the world and in certain periods of its history these powers and practices have prevailed. They were believed in because they existed and they existed because they were believed in. There was a continued interaction of cause and effect, of faith and works. People who look superficially at these things delight in saying that the more the witches were persecuted, the more they abounded, and that when the persecution ceased we heard no more of them. Naturally, the more they were persecuted, the more they believed in witchcraft and in themselves. When persecution ceased and men in authority declared that there was no such thing as witchcraft or witches, they lost their faith, and with it that little sovereignty over nature that that faith had conquered. Here we also see an explanation of the power attributed to blessings and curses. The word of God is creative, and man is the child of God made in his image, who never outgrows his childhood, and is often most a child when he thinks himself the wisest. For the wisdom of this world we cannot too often repeat is foolishness before God and being a child his faculties are feeble in proportion. But though limited in amount they are divine in kind and are latent in all of us, still shooting up here and there to amaze and perplex the wise and make merry the foolish who have nearly all alike forgotten their origin and disowned their birthright. End of chapter 11. Recording by Philip Gould. Chapter 12 of the night side of nature or ghosts and ghost seers this is a librivox recording 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Night Side of Nature, or Ghosts and Ghost Seers, by Catherine Crow, Chapter Twelve, Troubled Spirits. A very curious circumstance illustrative of the power of will was lately narrated to me by a greek gentleman to whose uncle it occurred his uncle mr m was some years ago travelling in magnesia with a friend when they arrived one evening at a caravanserai where they found themselves unprovided with anything to eat it was therefore agreed that one should go forth and endeavor to procure food and the friend offering to undertake the office mr m stretched himself on the floor to repose some time had lapsed and his friend had not yet returned when his attention was attracted by a whispering in the room he looked up but saw nobody though still the whispering continued seeming to go round by the wall at length it approached him but though he felt a burning sensation on his cheek and heard the whispering distinctly he could not catch the words presently he heard the footsteps of his friend and thought he was returning but though they appeared to come quite close to him and it was perfectly light he still saw nobody then he felt a strange sensation an irresistible impulse to rise he felt himself drawn up across the room out of the door down the stairs he must go he could not help it to the gate of the caravan's ride a little farther and there he found the dead body of his friend who had been suddenly assailed and cut down by robbers unhappily too plenty in the neighborhood at that period we hear see the desire of the spirit to communicate his fate to the survivor the imperfection of the report or the receptivity which prevented a more direct intercourse and the exertion of a magnetic influence which mr m could not resist precisely similar to that of a living magnetizer over his patient there is a story extant in various english collections the circumstances of which are said to have occurred about the middle of the last century and which i shall here mention on account of its similarity to the one that follows it dr breton who was late in life appointed rector of ludgate lived previously in Herefordshire where he married the daughter of dr santer a woman of great piety and virtue this lady died and one day as a former servant of hers to whom she had been attached and who had since married was nursing her child in her own cottage the door opened and the lady entered so exactly resembling the late mrs breton in dress and appearance that she exclaimed if my mistress were not dead i should think you were she whereupon the apparition told her that she was and requested her to go with her as she had business of importance to communicate alice objected being very much frightened and entreated her to address herself rather to dr breton but mrs b answered that she had endeavoured to do so and had been several times in his room for that purpose but he was still asleep and she had no power to do more toward awakening him than once uncover his feet alice then pleaded that she had nobody to live with her child but mrs b promising that the child should sleep to her return she at length obeyed the summons 
and having accompanied the apparition into a large field the latter bade her observe how much she measured off with her feet and having taken a considerable compass she bade her go and tell her brother that all that portion had been wrongfully taken from the poor by their father and that he must restore it to them adding that she was the more concerned about it since her name had been used in the transaction alice then asking how she should satisfy the gentleman of the truth of her mission mrs b mentioned to her some circumstance known only to herself and this brother she then entered into much discourse with the woman and gave her a great deal of good advice remaining to hearing the sound of horse bells she said alice i must be seen by none but yourself and then disappeared whereupon alice proceeded to dr breton who admitted that he had actually heard some one walking about his room in a way he could not account for on mentioning the thing to the brother he laughed heartily till alice communicated the secret which constituted her credentials upon which he changed his tone and declared himself ready to make the required restitution dr breton seems to have made no secret of this story but to have related it to various persons and i think it is somewhat in its favour that it exhibits a remarkable instance of the various degrees of receptivity of different individuals where there was no suspicion of the cause nor any attempt made to explain why mrs breton could not communicate her wishes to her husband as easily as to alice the promising that the child should sleep was promising no more than many a magnetizer could fulfill there are several curious stories extant of lame and suffering persons suddenly recovering who attributed their restoration to the visit of an apparition which had stroked their limbs etc and these are the more curious from the fact that they occurred before mesmer's time when people in general knew nothing of vital magnetism dr beans quotes the case of a person named jacob olafson a resident in some small island subject to denmark who after lying very ill for a fortnight was found quite well which he accounted for by saying that a person in shining clothes had come to him in the night and stroked him with his hand whereupon he was presently healed but the stroking is not always necessary since we know that the eye and the will can produce the same effect the other case to which i alluded as similar to that of mrs breton occurred in germany and is related by dr kerner the late mr l s t he says quitted this world with an excellent reputation being at the time superintendent of an institution for the relief of the poor in b his son inherited his property and in acknowledgment of the faithful services of his father's old housekeeper he took her into his family and established her in a country house a few miles from b which formed part of his inheritance she had been settled there but a short time when she was awakened in the night she knew not how and saw a tall haggard-looking man in her room who was rendered visible to her by a light that seemed to issue from himself she drew the bed clothes over her head but as this apparition appeared to her repeatedly she became so much alarmed that she mentioned it to her master begging permission to resign her situation he however laughed at her told her it must be all imagination 
and promised to sleep in the adjoining apartment in order that she might call him whenever this terror seized her he did so but when the spectre returned she was so much oppressed with horror that she found it impossible to raise her voice her master then advised her to inquire the motive of its visits this she did whereupon it beckoned her to follow which after some struggles she summoned resolution to do it then led the way down some steps to a passage where it pointed out to her a concealed closet which it signified to her by signs she should open she represented that she had no key whereupon it described to her in sufficiently articulate words where she would find one she procured the key and on opening the closet found a small parcel which the spirit desired her to remit to the governor of the institution for the poor at b with the injunction that the contents should be applied to the benefit of the inmates this restitution being the only means whereby he could obtain rest and peace in the other world having mentioned these circumstances to her master who bade her do what she had been desired she took the parcel to the governor and delivered it without communicating by what means it had come into her hands her name was entered in their books and she was dismissed but after she was gone they discovered to their surprise that the packet contained an order for thirty thousand florins of which the late mr s t had defrauded the institution and converted to his own use mr s t junior was now called upon to pay the money which he refused to do the affair was at length referred to the authorities and the housekeeper being arrested he and she were confronted in the court where she detailed the circumstances by which the parcel had come into her possession mr s t denied the possibility of the thing declaring the whole must be for some purpose or other an invention of her own suddenly while making this defence he felt a blow upon his shoulder which caused him to start and look around and at the same moment the housekeeper exclaimed see there he stands now there is the ghost none perceived the figure excepting the woman herself and mr s t but everybody present heard the following words my son repair the injustice i have committed that i may be at peace the money was paid and mr s t was so much affected by this painful event that he was seized with a severe illness from which he with difficulty recovered dr kerner says that these circumstances occurred in the year eighteen sixteen and created a considerable sensation at the time though at the earnest request of the family of mr s t there was an attempt made to hush them up adding that in the month of october eighteen nineteen he was himself assured by a very respectable citizen of b that it was universally known in the town that the ghost of the late superintendent had appeared to the housekeeper and pointed out to her where she would find the packet that she had consulted the minister of her parish who bade her deliver it as directed that she had been subsequently arrested and the affair brought before the authorities where while making his defence mr s t had received a blow from an invisible hand and that mr s t was so much affected by these circumstances which got abroad in spite of the efforts to suppress them that he did not long survive the event grows the antiquary 
makes himself very merry with the observation that ghosts do not go about their business like other people and that in cases of murder instead of going to the nearest justice of peace or to the nearest relation of the deceased a ghost addresses itself to somebody who had nothing to do with the matter or hovers about the grave where its body is deposited the same circuitous mode is pursued he says with respect to redressing injured orphans or widows where it seems as if the shortest and most certain way would be to go and haunt the person guilty of the injustice till he were terrified into restitution we find the same sort of strictures made on the story of the ghost of sir george villiers which instead of going directly to his son the duke of buckingham to warn him of his danger addressed himself to an inferior person while the warning was after all inefficacious as the duke would not take counsel but surely such strictures are as absurd as the conduct of the ghost at least i think there can be nothing more absurd than pretending to prescribe laws to nature and judging of what we know so little about the proceedings of the ghost in the following case will doubtless be equally displeasing to the critics the account is extracted verbatim from a work published by the bannatine club and is entitled authentic account of the appearance of a ghost in queen anne's county maryland united states of north america proved in the following remarkable trial from attested notes taken in court at the time by one of the counsel it appears that thomas harris had made some alteration in the disposal of his property immediately previous to his death and that the family disputed the will and raised up difficulties likely to be injurious to his children william briggs said that he was forty-three years of age that thomas harris died in september in the year seventeen ninety in the march following he was riding near the place where thomas harris was buried on a horse formerly belonging to thomas harris after crossing a small branch his horse began to walk on very fast it was between the hours of eight and nine o'clock in the morning he was alone it was a clear day he entered a lane adjoining to the field where thomas harris was buried his horse suddenly wheeled in a panel of the fence looked over the fence into the field where thomas harris was buried and neighed very loud witness then saw thomas harris coming toward him in the same opera he had last seen him in in his lifetime he had on a sky-blue coat just before he came to the fence he varied to the right and vanished his horse immediately took the road thomas harris came within two panels of the fence to him he did not see his features nor speak to him he was acquainted with thomas harris when a boy and there had always been a great intimacy between them he thinks the horse knew thomas harris because of his neighing pricking up his ears and looking over the fence about the first of june following he was ploughing in his own field about three miles from where thomas harris was buried about dusk thomas harris came alongside of him and walked with him about two hundred yards he was dressed as when first seen he made a halt about two steps from him j bailey who was ploughing along with him came driving up and he lost sight of the ghost he was much alarmed not a word was spoken the young man bailey did not see him he did not tell bailey of it 
there was no motion of any particular part he vanished it preyed upon his mind so as to affect his health he was with thomas harris when he died but had no particular conversation with him some time after he was lying in bed about eleven and twelve o'clock at night when he heard thomas harris groan it was like the groan he gave a few minutes before he expired mrs briggs his wife heard the groan she got up and searched the house he did not because he knew the groan to be from thomas harris some time after when in bed and a great firelight in the room he saw a shadow on the wall and at the same time he felt a great weight upon him some time after when in bed and asleep he felt a stroke between his eyes which blackened them both his wife was in bed with him and two young men were in the room the blow awaked him and all in the room were asleep is certain no one in the room struck him the blow swelled his nose about the middle of august he was alone coming from hickey collins after dark about one hour in the night when thomas harris appeared dressed as he had seen him when going down to the meeting-house branch three miles and a half from the graveyard of thomas harris it was starlight he extended his arms over his shoulders does not know how long he remained in this situation he was much alarmed thomas harris disappeared nothing was said he felt no weight on his shoulders he went back to collins and got a young man to go with him after he got home he mentioned it to the young man he had before this told james harris he had seen his brother's ghost in october about twilight in the morning he saw thomas harris about one hundred yards from the house of the witness his head was leaned to one side same apparel as before his face was toward him he walked fast and disappeared there was nothing between them to obstruct the view he was about fifty yards from him and alone he had no conception why thomas harris appeared to him on the same day about eight o'clock in the morning he was handing up blades to john bailey who was stacking them he saw thomas harris come along the garden fence dressed as before he vanished and always to the east was within fifteen feet of him bailey did not see him an hour and a half afterward in the same place he again appeared coming as before came up to the fence leaned on it within ten feet of the witness who called to bailey to look there pointing toward thomas harris bailey asked what was there don't you see harris does not recollect what bailey said witness advanced toward harris one or the other spoke as witness got over the fence on the same panel that thomas harris was leaning on they walked off together about five hundred yards a conversation took place as they walked he has not the conversation on his memory he could not understand thomas harris his voice was so low he asked thomas harris a question and he forbid him witness then asked why not go to your brother instead of me thomas harris said ask me no questions witness told him his will was doubted thomas harris told him to ask his brother if he did not remember the conversation which passed between them on the east side of the wheat stacks the day he was taken with his death sickness that he then declared that he wished all his property kept together by james harris until his children arrived at age then the whole should be sold and divided among his children and should it be immediately sold 
as expressed in his will that the property would be most wanting to his children while minors therefore he had changed his will and said that witness should see him again he then told witness to turn and disappeared he did not speak to him with the same voice as in his lifetime he was not daunted while with thomas harris but much afterward witness then went to james harris and told him that he had seen his brother three times that day related the conversation he had with him asked james harris if he remembered the conversation between him and his brother at the wheat stack he said he did then told him what had passed said he would fulfill his brother's will he was satisfied that witness had seen his brother for that no other person knew the conversation on the same evening returning home about an hour before sunset thomas harris appeared to him and came alongside of him witness told him that his brother said he would fulfill his will no more conversation on this subject he disappeared he had further conversation with thomas harris but not on this subject he was always dressed in the same manner he had never related to any person the last conversation and never would bailey who was sworn in the cause declared that as he and briggs were stacking blades as related by briggs he called to witness and said look there do you not see thomas harris witness said no briggs got over the fence and walked at some distance appeared by his action to be in deep conversation with some person witness saw no one the counsel was extremely anxious to hear from mr briggs the whole of the conversation of the ghost and on his cross examination took every means without effect to obtain it they represented to him as a religious man he was bound to disclose the whole truth he appeared agitated when applied to declaring nothing short of life should make him review the whole conversation and claiming the protection of the court that he had declared all he knew relative to the case the court overruled the question of the counsel hon james tilman judge his excellency robert wright late governor of maryland and the hon joseph h nicholson afterward judge of one of the courts in maryland for the counsel for the plaintiff john scott and richard t earl squires were counsel for the defendant here as in the case of colonel m mentioned in a former chapter and some others i have met with we find disclosures made that were held sacred dr kerner relates the following singular story which he declares himself to have received from the most satisfactory authority agnes b being at the time eighteen years of age was living as servant in a small inn at undenheim her native place the host and hostess were a quiet old people who generally went to bed about eight o'clock while she and the boy the only other servant were expected to sit up till ten when they had to shut up the house and retire to bed also one evening as the host was sitting on a bench before the door there came a beggar requesting a night's lodging the host however refused and bade him seek what he wanted in the village where on the man went away at the usual hour the old people went to bed and the two servants having closed the shutters and indulged in a little gossip with the watchman were about to follow their example when the beggar came round the corner of the neighboring street and earnestly entreated them to give him a lodging for the night since he could find nobody that would take him in at first the young people refused saying they dare not without their master's leave but at length the entreaties of the man prevailed 
and they consented to let him sleep in the barn on condition that when they called him in the morning he would immediately depart at three o'clock they rose and when the boy entered the barn to his dismay he found that the old man had expired in the night they were now much perplexed with the apprehension of their master's displeasure so after some consultation they agreed that the lad should convey the body out of the barn and lay it in a dry ditch that was near at hand where it would be found by the laborers and excite no question as they would naturally conclude he had led himself down there to die this was done the man was discovered and buried and they thought themselves well rid of the whole affair but on the following night the girl was awakened by the beggar whom she saw standing at her bedside he looked at her and then quitted the room by the door glad was i she says when the day broke but i was scarcely out of my room when the boy came to me trembling and pale and before i could say a word to him of what i had seen he told me that the beggar had been to his room in the night had looked at him and then gone away he said he was dressed as when we had seen him alive only he looked blacker which i also had observed still afraid of incurring blame they told nobody although the apparition returned to them every night and although they found removing to the other bed chambers did not relieve them from his visits but the effects of this persecution became so visible on both that much curiosity was awakened in the village with respect to the cause of the alteration observed in them and at length the boy's mother went to the minister and requesting him to interrogate her son and endeavor to discover what was preying on his mind to him the boy disclosed their secret and this minister who was a protestant having listened with attention to the story advised him when next he went to mayence to market to call on father joseph of the franciscan convent and relate the circumstance to him this advice was followed and father joseph assuring the lad that the ghost could do him no harm recommended him to ask him in the name of god what he desired the boy did so whereupon the apparition answered ye are children of mercy but i am a child of evil in the barn under the straw you will find my money take it it is yours in the morning the boy found the money accordingly in an old stocking hid under the straw but having a natural horror of it they took it to their minister who advised them to divide it into three parts giving one to the franciscan convent at mayence another to the reformed church in the village and the other third to that to which they themselves belonged which was of the lutheran persuasion this they did and were no more troubled with the beggar with respect to the minister who gave them this good advice i can only say all honour be to him i wish there were many more such the circumstance occurred in the year seventeen fifty and is related by the daughter of agnes b who declared that she had frequently heard it from her mother the circumstance of this apparition looking darker than the man had done when alive is significant of his condition and confirms what i have said above namely that the moral state of the disembodied soul can no longer be concealed as it was in the flesh but that as he is he must necessarily appear there is an old saying that we should never lie down to rest at empty with any human being and the story of the ghost of the princess anna of saxony who appeared to duke christian of sax eisenberg 
is strongly confirmatory of the wisdom of this axiom duke christian was sitting one morning in his study when he was surprised by a knock at his door an unusual circumstance since the guards as well as the people in waiting were always in the ante-room he however cried come in when there entered to his amazement a lady in an ancient costume who in answer to his inquiries told him that she was no evil spirit and would do him no harm but that she was one of his ancestors and had been the wife of duke john casimir of saxe coburg she then related that she and her husband had not been on good terms at the period of their death and that although she had sought a reconciliation he had been inexorable pursuing her with unmitigated hatred and injuring her by unjust suspicions and that consequently although she was happy he was still wandering in cold and darkness between time and eternity she had however long known that one of their descendants was destined to effect this reconciliation for them and they were rejoiced to find the time for it had at length arrived she then gave the duke eight days to consider if he were willing to perform this good office and disappeared whereupon he consulted a clergyman in whom he had great confidence who after finding the ghost's communication verified by a reference to the annals of the family advised him to comply with her request as the duke had yet some difficulty in believing it was really a ghost he had seen he took care to have his door well watched she however entered at the appointed time unseen by the attendants and having received the duke's promise she told him she would return with her husband on the following night for that though she could come by day he could not that then having heard the circumstances the duke must arbitrate between them and then unite their hands and bless them the door was still watched but nevertheless the apparitions both came the duke casimir in full royal costume but of a livid paleness and when the wife had told her story he told his duke christian decided for the lady in which judgment duke casimir fully acquiesced christian then took the ice-cold hand of casimir and laid it in that of his wife which felt of a natural heat they then prayed and sang together and the apparitions disappeared having foretold that duke christian would ere long be with them the family records show that these people had lived about one hundred years before duke christian's time who himself died in seventeen o seven two years after these visits of his ancestors he desired to be buried in quicklime it is supposed from an idea that it might prevent his ghost walking the earth the costume in which they appeared was precisely that they had worn when alive as was ascertained by a reference to their portraits the expression that her husband was wandering in cold and darkness between time and eternity is here very worthy of observation as are the circumstances that his hand was cold while hers was warm and also the greater privilege she seemed to enjoy the hands of the unhappy spirits appear i think invariably to communicate a sensation of cold i have heard of three instances of persons now alive who declare that they hold continual intercourse with their deceased partners one of these is a naval officer whom the author of a book lately published called the unseen world appears to be acquainted with the second is a professor in a college in america a man of eminence and learning and full of activity and energy 
yet he assured a friend of mine that he receives constant visits from his departed wife which afford him great satisfaction the third example is a lady in this country she is united to a second husband has been extremely happy in both marriages and declares that she receives frequent visits from her first oberlin the good pastor of ban de la roche asserted the same thing of himself his wife came to him frequently after her death was seen by the rest of his household as well as himself and warned him beforehand of many events that occurred mrs matthews relates in the memoirs of her husband that he was one night in bed and unable to sleep from the excitement that continues some time after acting when hearing a rustling by the side of the bed he looked out and saw his first wife who was then dead standing by the bedside dressed as when alive she smiled and bent forward as if to take his hand but in his alarm he threw himself out on the floor to avoid the contact and was found by the landlord in a fit the same night and the same hour the present mrs matthews who was far away from him received a similar visit from her predecessor whom she had known when alive she was quite awake and in her terror seized the bell rope to summon assistance which gave way and she fell with it in her hand to the ground professor barth who visited oberlin in eighteen twenty four says that while he spoke of his intercourse with the spiritual world as familiarly as of the daily visits of his parishioners he was at the same time perfectly free from fanaticism and eagerly alive to all the concerns of this earthly existence he asserted what i find many somnambules and deceased persons also assert that everything on earth is but a copy of which the antitype is to be found in the other he said to his visitor that he might as well attempt to persuade him that there was not a table before them as that he did not hold communication with the other world i give you credit for being honest when you assure me that you never saw anything of the kind said he give me the same credit and i assure you that i do with respect to the faculty of coast seeing he said it depends on several circumstances external and internal people who live in the bustle and glare of the world seldom see them while those who live in still solitary thinly inhabited places like the mountainous districts of various countries do so if i go into the forest by night i see the phosphoric light of a piece of rotten wood but if i go by day i cannot see it yet it is still there again there must be a report a tender mother is awakened by the faintest cry of her infant while the maid slumbers on and never hears it and if i thrust a needle among a parcel of wood shavings and hold a magnet over them the needle is stirred while the shavings are quite unmoved there must be a particular aptitude what it consists in i do not know four of my people many of whom are ghost seers some are weak and sickly others vigorous and strong here are several pieces of flint i can see no difference in them yet some have so much iron in them that they easily become magnetic others have little or none so it is with the faculty of ghost seeing people may laugh as they will but the thing is a fact nevertheless the visits of his wife continued for nine years after her death and then ceased 
at length she sent him a message through another deceased person to say that she was now elevated to a higher state and could therefore no longer revisit the earth never was there a purer spirit nor a more beloved human being than oberlin when first he was appointed to the cure of ban de la roche and found his people talking so familiarly of the reappearance of the dead he reproved them and preached against the superstition nor was he convinced till after the death of his wife she had however previously received a visit from her deceased sister the wife of professor oberlin of strasbourg who had warned her of her approaching death for which she immediately set about preparing making extra clothing for her children and even laying in provision for the funeral feast she then took leave of her husband and family and went quietly to bed on the following morning she died and oberlin never heard of the warning she had received till she disclosed it to him in her spectral visitations in narrating the following story i am not permitted to give the names of the place or parties nor the number of the regiment with all of which however i am acquainted the account was taken down by one of the officers with whose family i am also acquainted and the circumstance occurred within the last ten years about the month of august says captain e my attention was requested by the schoolmaster sergeant a man of considerable worth and highly esteemed by the whole corps to an event which had occurred in the garrison hospital having heard his recital which from the serious earnestness with which he made it challenged attention i resolved to investigate the matter and having communicated the circumstances to a friend we both repaired to the hospital for the purpose of inquiry there were two patients to be examined both men of good character and neither of them suffering from any disorder affecting the brain the one was under treatment for consumptive symptoms and the other for an ulcerated leg they were both in the prime of life having received a confirmation of the schoolmaster's statement from the hospital surgeon also a very respectable and trustworthy man i sent for the patient principally concerned and desired him to state what he had seen and heard warning him at the same time that it was my intention to take down his deposition and that it behooved him to be very careful as possibly serious steps might be taken for the purpose of discovering whether an imposition had been practised in the wards of the hospital a crime for which he was well aware a very severe penalty would be inflicted he then proceeded to relate the circumstances which i took down in the presence of mr b and the hospital sergeant as follows it was last tuesday night somewhere between eleven and twelve and all of us were in bed and all lights out except the rush light that was allowed for the man with the fever when i was woke by feeling a weight upon my feet and at the same moment as i was drawing up my legs private w who lies in the cot opposite mine called out i say q there is somebody sitting upon your legs and as i looked to the bottom of my bed i saw someone get up from it and then come round and stand over me in the passage between my cot and the next i felt somewhat alarmed for the last few nights the ward had been disturbed by sounds as of a heavy foot walking up and down and as nobody could be seen it was beginning to be supposed among us that it was haunted and fancying this that came up to my bed's head might be the ghost i called out who are you and what do you want the figure then leaning with one hand on the wall over my head 
and stooping down said in my ear i am mrs m and i could then distinguish that she was dressed in a flannel gown edged with black ribband exactly similar to a set of grave clothes in which i had assisted to clothe her corpse when her death took place a year previously the vase however was not like mrs m s nor like anybody else's yet it was very distinct and seemed somehow to sink through my head i could see nothing of a face beyond a darkish color about the head and it appeared to me that i could see through her body against the window glasses although i felt very uncomfortable i asked her what she wanted she replied i am mrs m and i wish you to write to him that was my husband and tell him i am not sir said corporal q at liberty to mention to anybody what she told me except to her husband he is at the depot in ireland and i have written and told him she made me promise not to tell anyone else after i had promised secrecy she told me something of a matter that convinced me i was talking to a spirit for it related to what only i and mrs m knew and no one living could know anything whatever of the matter and if i was now speaking my last words on earth i say solemnly that it was mrs m s spirit that spoke to me then and no one else after promising that if i complied with her request she would not trouble me or the world again she went from my bed toward the fireplace and with her hands she kept feeling about the wall over the mantelpiece after a while she came toward me again and while my eyes were upon her she somehow disappeared from my sight altogether and i was left alone it was then that i felt faint like and a cold sweat broke out over me but i did not faint and after a time i got better and gradually i went off to sleep the man at ward said next day that mrs m had come to speak to me about purgatory because she had been a roman catholic and we had often had arguments on religion but what she told me had no reference to such subjects but to a matter only she and i knew of after closely cross-questioning corporal q and endeavouring without success to reason him out of his belief in the ghostly character of his visitor i read over to him what i had written and then dismissing him sent for the other patient after cautioning him as i had done the first i proceeded to take down his statement which was made with every appearance of good faith and sincerity i was lying awake said he last tuesday night when i saw someone sitting on corporal q's bed there was so little light in the ward that i could not make out who it was and the figure looked so strange that i got alarmed and felt quite sick i called out to corporal q that there was somebody sitting upon his bed and then the figure got up and as i did not know but it might be coming to me i got so much alarmed that being but weakly this was the consumptive man i fell back and i believe i fainted away when i got round again i saw the figure standing and apparently talking to the corporal placing one hand against the wall and stooping down i could not however hear any voice and being still much alarmed i put my head under the clothes for a considerable time when i looked up again i could only see corporal q sitting up in bed alone and he said he had seen a ghost and i told him i had also seen it after a time he got up and gave me a drink of water for i was very faint some of the other patients being disturbed by our talking they bade us be quiet and after some time i got to sleep the ward has not been disturbed since 
the man was then cross-questioned but his testimony remaining quite unshaken he was dismissed and the hospital surgeon was interrogated with regard to the possibility of a trick having been practised he asserted however that this was impossible and certainly from my own knowledge of the hospital regulations and the habits of the patients i should say that a practical joke of this nature was too serious a thing to have been attempted by anybody especially as there were patients in war very ill at the time and one very near his end the punishment would have been extremely severe and discovery almost certain since everybody would have been adverse to the delinquent the investigation that ensued was a very brief one it being found that there was nothing more to be elicited and the affair terminated with the supposition that the two men had been dreaming nevertheless six months afterward on being interrogated their evidence and their conviction were as clear as at first and they declared themselves ready at any time to repeat their statement upon oath supposing this case to be as the men believed it there are several things worthy of observation in the first place the ghost is guilty of that inconsistency so offensive to francis gross and many others instead of telling her secret to her husband she commissions the corporal to tell it him and it is not till a year after her departure from this life that she does even that and she is hurt in war two or three nights before she is visible we are therefore constrained to suppose that like mrs breton she could not communicate with her husband and that to that tuesday night the necessary conditions for attaining her object as regarded the corporal were wanting it is also remarkable that although the latter heard her speak distinctly and spoke to her the other man heard no voice which renders it probable that she had at length been able to produce that impression upon him which a magnetizer does on his somnambule enable each to understand the other by a transference of thought which was undistinguishable to the corporal from speech as it is frequently to the somnambule the imitating the actions of life by leaning against the wall and feeling about the mantelpiece are very unlike what a person would have done who was endeavouring to impose on the man and equally unlike what they would have reported had the thing been an invention of their own among the established jests on the subject of ghosts their sudden vanishing is a very fruitful one but i think if we examine this question we shall find that there is nothing comical in the matter except the ignorance or want of reflection of the jesters in the first place as i have before observed a spirit must be where its thoughts and affections are for they are itself our spirits are where our thoughts and affections are although our solid bodies remain stationary and no one will suppose that walls or doors or material obstacles of any kind could exclude a spirit any more than they can exclude our thoughts but then there is the visible body of the spirit what is that and how does it retain its shape for we know that there is a law discovered by dalton that two masses of gaseous matter cannot remain in contact but they will immediately proceed to diffuse themselves into one another and accordingly it may be advanced that a gaseous corpority and the atmosphere is an impossibility because it could not retain its form but would inevitably be dissolved away and blend with the surrounding air but precisely the same objection might be made by a chemist to the possibility of our fleshly bodies retaining their integrity and compactness for the human body taken as a whole is known to be an impossible chemical compound except for the vitality which upholds it 
and no sooner is life withdrawn from it than it crumbles into putrescence and it is undeniable that the aeriform body would be an impossible mechanical phenomenon but for the vitality which we are entitled to suppose may uphold it but just as the state or condition of organization protects the fleshly body from the natural reactions which would destroy it so may an analogous condition of organization protect a spiritual ethereal body from the destructive influence of the mutual interdiffusion of gases thus supposing this aeriform body to be a permanent appurtenance of the spirit we see how it may subsist and retain its integrity and it would be as reasonable to hope to exclude the electric fluid by walls or doors as to exclude by them this subtle fluent form if on the contrary the shape be only one constructed out of the atmosphere by an act of will the same act of will which is a vital force preserve it entire until the will being withdrawn it dissolves away in either case the moment the will or thought of the spirit is elsewhere it is gone it has vanished for those who prefer the other hypothesis namely that there is no outstanding shape at all but that the will of the spirit acting on the constructive imagination of the seer enables him to conceive the form as the spirit itself conceives of it there can be no difficulty in understanding that the becoming invisible will depend merely on a similar act of will end of chapter twelve troubled spirits